Welcome everyone to this lecture on the educational thought of Maria Montessori. And in particular, how Montessori can help all of us remember about the central significance of learning to see the students we teach. Probably most of you who have tuned into this broadcast know of Montessori as the namesake for the pedagogy at a local preschool or elementary school in your neighborhood. Maybe you have your own child enrolled in a Montessori school or in a Montessori music program. For those of you who don't know much about Monterey, or Maria Montessori, she was quite an accomplished 20th century figure in education. The first female doctor of medicine in Italy, Montessori began her educational work with disabled children and then opened her first Casa dei Bambini, or Children's House, in 1907. I think that maybe the best way to get at the core outlook of Montessori education is to examine her account of founding this first school, and in particular, um, when I initially read it, the account kind of struck me as being somewhat similar to St. Augustine's experience in the garden. He recounts that in Book 8 of his Confessions. Anyway, for Montessori, her time managing this first school was a deep foundational moment of seeing and realization. And it seems to me that her accounting of it takes on a powerful and mythical significance in her own life's work. So here's the gist of the story. Montessori was given the task to run a school, basically just a large room in a dilapidated tenement building where around 50 children of local parents who were among the most poverty stricken in all of Rome could send their children during the day as they scrambled from day to day to find some pittance at work that might afford them the most basic means to eke out their family's existence. And she writes of how sad and neglected these children were and how the space for their school was provided not so much as an act of philanthropy, but rather because the landlord wanted to find a means of rounding up all the local children in one supervised area so as to avoid any further damage to his buildings. Her tale about this school, and the foundational seeing that her Montessori approach entails, begins on the Feast of the Epiphany. For those of you who don't know much about religious holidays, the word epiphany comes from the Greek epiphania, meaning something like a revelation, or I guess a revelation of the truth, or a manifestation of insight that comes through deep seeing into the reality of things. In Western Christian practice, this word epiphany came to be associated with the birth of Christ, or the incarnation of God as man, and with the Magi, or the three wise men, uh, coming to see him as the baby lay in his manger. This is the tradition with him which Montessori most clearly identifies. As a side note, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Epiphany is associated not with the baby Jesus, but rather with Christ later in life at his baptism. In either case, the feast day or the day of celebration each year in honor of the revelation of God in man is called the Epiphany, and sometimes it's called the, the Theophany, which literally means the appearance of God. Okay, back to the story. Maria Montessori seems to have been a woman with very deep spiritual sensitivities long before she ever went into medicine. That is... She seems to have lived a life in which she really wanted to see the world and the people around her and herself in a way that took none of it for granted. When I read her words, I get the strong sense that Maria was a person in love with being, seeking to know being, and having a, a heart that longs to love and to appreciate and through appreciation to understand. Her intellect, it seems to me, 
sought out the deep heart of things. Anyway, being somebody already keenly attuned to the need to see properly, Maria was also trained very carefully as a scientist in the art of observation. In her book, The Discovery of the Child, she speaks passionately about the need for anyone who's going to be a decent teacher or for anyone who really wants to come to know the true nature of childhood and to see the actual children before them, how such a person must adopt a scientific or experimentally minded attitude. Now, what does this mean? What is the meaning of science in Montessori's lexicon? She writes, We may define a scientist as one who, during the course of an experiment, has perceived something that leads to a further investigation of the profound truths of life and has lifted the veil which hid its fascinating secrets, and who, in the pursuit of this knowledge, has felt so passionate a love for the mysteries of nature that he forgets himself. Unquote. Now this is a really excellent definition of the true scientist, ladies and gentlemen. In many ways, it seems pretty foreign to what we mostly think about science. And we think about science most often as dispassionate study, don't we? That is, scientific knowing seems to us to be quite different from the kind of knowing by loving that we do when we come to know each other in intimate and personal ways, say in friendship, family, and marriage, or, you know, through poetry, art, or music. Scientific knowing, rather, appears to bracket out that kind of intimacy as non-objective and sullied by sentiment. It seems that we must suspend all such feeling as unscientific sentimentality, no? Scientific knowing seems rather to demand a kind of cold, objective gaze that casts what is sought to be known away from ourselves in order to make it an object of study. Indeed, this is precisely the meaning of the word object, which is derived from the Latin ob iectum, meaning to throw over against oneself. And yet, here we have Maria telling us a delightful thing, ladies and gentlemen. Science, true science, need not at all be like that. Quite the contrary. Science most certainly is passionate and loving in its pursuit of truth. And moreover, in Maria's articulation of it, as one enters into that sweet spot of scientific study, what the ancients referred to as true studium, we achieve um, a remarkable personal transformation because our love, or rather the love that fills us, empties us of ourselves and our rampant egoism. See, we forget ourselves, right? When we're so focused in on um, a scientific problem, we lose... We lose track of, you know, I'm doing this, I'm thinking this. This is, no, we, we get so involved in the problem, we lose ourselves. Where in ordinary events, we're perhaps dogged by ourselves, by our selfishness, and by our egos. In our contemplation, and in our unfurling of the mysteries of nature, we forget ourselves, miraculously. Where perhaps in other things, we find this loosening of the ego's grip well nigh impossible. Here it comes imperceptibly, surprisingly, effortlessly as a gift to us. Any of you who have ever felt the joy of study, of losing yourself in study, you know precisely what I mean. See here now, for, um, or see here how for Maria Montessori, science is actually a very deep spiritual practice. She writes poignantly, quote, I personally believe that we should give more attention to imparting a spirit to teachers than scientific techniques, unquote. <laughs> How shocking, eh? When so much of what now passes for teacher training and teacher education in B.Ed. programs focuses on the teacher as technician, the teacher's toolbox, or the effective use of education technologies. 
on the teacher as one who knows all the most effective techniques and has in some sense internalized a manual on which of, of which techniques to use in which particular situations and with which sorts of children. This is, in Montessori's view, all secondary to the real heart of what student teachers or teachers in training need to learn about. That is, we need to learn the art of seeing. And the art of seeing can only be learned if a particular spirit inhabits us. In other words, what Montessori advocates for and seeks out isn't a particular set of techniques, but rather a particular way of life and a type of man, unquote. For, as she writes, this is the type of man to whom nature reveals her secrets and crowns with the glory of discovery. This is the type of man, says Montessori, who has cultivated a spirit that is receptive towards the epiphanic, towards the revelation of the divine nature within each human being. Only such a one might have his or her soul prepared for celebration of a theophany. Indeed, in her work, The Discovery of the Child, Montessori writes powerfully, powerfully about the peculiar, special character of this new educator as a composite being, a person who is one part scientist and one part mystic. Quote, Let us strive to pour into a single soul the keen spirit of sacrifice of a scientist and the ineffable ecstasy of of such a mystic, and we shall have the perfect spirit of our teacher. Unquote. <laughs> I don't know about you, but reading Maria Montessori makes me all excited to be a teacher again. Sometimes, when you teach for a long time, you get muddied in your soul with all the busyness and the sterility of the tasks set before you. All the familiarity can breed a kind of laziness and even contempt for what you've been given when you become a teacher. And then, there's not just your ingratitude. There's the ingratitude and apathy of your students, of administrators, of parents. Really, the whole system is in many ways set up constantly to eat away at this core beauty that Montessori would have us attend to. So it's really, really important for us to find ways each day to cultivate the kind of seeing that Maria Montessori would have us constantly remember and practice. If we come to work each day with the understanding that this isn't just a job, but rather a way of life and a spiritual practice, we'll be on the right track. One of my favorite quotes from Maria Montessori about how we should be when we're with our students compares our work as teachers to the gestures of a priest as he performs sacred rituals. Now, I'm no priest, but let me quote it here for you. <clears throat> Not with careless, efficient hands, or with a mind intent on the achievement of goals, nor with molding our students' improvement, improving our students, holding our students to account, bending the will of our students to conform with expectations, but rather with purified hands, as well as studied and thoughtful motions, our actions ought to, quote, take place in silence and in darkness that is penetrated only by a light that has been softened in its passage through stained glass windows, unquote. When we teach... Our inner state ought to involve the cultivation of feelings of hope and elevation, and as best as we can, we ought to fashion our classrooms as sacred spaces for the work of education. And now these are not easy things to remember in the day-to-day -day of the lived classroom. Moreover, when you get your own classroom, you'll find they're certainly not easy goods to secure. Classrooms can be very unsacred feeling places at times. You might, for instance, find that you're able to lead things better in this direction with one class of students, but with another? Such aspirations are like pie in the sky. And yes, Montessori is speaking specifically in this passage about how we should interact with newborns and infants. 
and their need for darkness and silence. She's not talking about older students in this priest uh, sacred space metaphor. But why is its application so out of place? Is what Montessori comes to see in her first Casa dei Bambini only the truth about small children? Or is it a general truth that applies to all of us? And that is equally transformational for each one of us. I put it to you that the seeing Maria draws our attention to among the smallest of children is rather a metaphor for the sort of seeing that we must cultivate in all aspects of our lives. How does one go about this kind of seeing and observing? Well, according to Montessori, the adult or teacher who wishes to see in this fashion, and who wishes his or her students to benefit from seeing in this manner, must observe, but keep his or her observations unobtrusive. He or she must, in a sense, remain concealed so as not to disturb them as they're busy about their work in their natural environment. Among preschool and elementary age children, the role of the teacher is described by Montessori as follows, quote, By his passive attitude, he removes from the children the, obstacles that is, uh, the obstacle that is created by his own activity and authority. The children can thus become active themselves. The teacher is satisfied when he sees them acting by themselves and making progress, unquote. The teacher practice of seeing, Montessori points out, is a very deep is in a very deep sense one of passivity rather than activity. Notice how, in her view, teaching involves a humbling of ourselves, making ourselves less, leaving our own egos behind, leaving behind our desire to interfere, to manipulate, to mold or to correct. Montessori writes, He, that is the student, must increase, but I, the teacher, must decrease. And that the art of education, when it's rightly understood, happens almost without teaching. Unquote. <laughs> Pretty wild, eh? And this sort of thing certainly doesn't jibe at all well with our own ideas and preconceptions about what makes a good teacher or a damn fine learning experience, does it? Probably lots of you, prior to your decision to become teachers, were emboldened and inspired to do so by some of the great teacher movies that we've all been, well, that we've all seen that have been pumped out by Hollywood. Really popular ones like To Sir With Love or Freedom Writers. Dangerous Minds, Mr. Holland's Opus, or School of Rock. <laughs> One of my all-time favorites is Dead Poets Society, in which Robin Williams plays an inspiring teacher by the name of John Keating, who brings uh, school and learning to life for a group of boys at an elite boarding school. Let me play a famous clip of Williams working his magic in the role of the teacher for you. Let's see if I can get this started here. Let's see. Here we go. Gentlemen, open your text. Page 21 of the introduction. Mr. Perry, will you read the opening paragraph of the preface entitled Understanding Poetry? Understanding Poetry by Dr. J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered, and two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection, question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem's score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph, and its importance is plotted on the vertical, then calculating the total area of the poem yields the measure of its greatness. 
a sonnet by Byron might score high on the vertical, but only average on the horizontal. A Shakespearean sonnet, on the other hand, would score high both horizontally and vertically, yielding a massive total area, thereby revealing the poem to be truly great. As you proceed through the poetry in this book, practice this rating method. As your ability to evaluate poems in this manner grows, so will, so will your enjoyment and understanding of poetry. Excrement. That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe. We're talking about poetry. How could you describe poetry like American bandstand? Well, I like Byron. I give him a 42, but I can't dance to it. <laughs> now, I want you to rip out that page. Go on. Rip out the entire page. Hear me. Rip it out. Rip it out. Go on. Rip it out. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Oh. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page, tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. History, leave nothing of it. Rip it out. Rip. Be gone, J. Evans Pritchard, PhD. Rip. Rip. Tear. Rip it out. I want to hear nothing but ripping of Mr. Pritchard. We'll perforate it. Put it on a roll. <laughs> That's the Bible. You're not going to go to hell for this. <laughs> Make a clean tear. I want nothing left of it. <laughs> disagree that this is a fine piece of teaching on poetry. Um, it's a wonderful, engaging moment. A well-spoken, poetic, inspired moment. It's from the heart, full of sincerity and gravity. It speaks the truth, and it passionately shares the truth with students. For all the trash talking nowadays about chalk and talk and lectures and whatnot, who would say that such speeches are inappropriate in a school, not worthwhile or educationally weak? And yet, Robin Williams' character, Mr. Keating, takes altogether a different sort of teacher stance than the one promulgated by Maria Montessori, doesn't he? That's not to say that the content of his heart is much different. I think that Mr. Keating is really trying to get his teenage students to wake up, to open up their eyes in the deep, wondering and appreciative manner advocated by Montessori, in fact. Mr. Keating goads his students through his own powerful personality and poignant words to seek to know themselves, doesn't he? And yet, Look at how he does it. He is what today is dismissed and scorned as the proverbial sage on the stage. You'll hear professors in B.Ed. programs, as well as administrators and HR people, speak derisively about the teacher who makes himself the center point of attention, from whom all his students' insights and knowledge are to be derived. The epicenter of that earthquake that erupts in the soul of the one who really listens to his teacher's words. Nowadays, in our culture, and, um, well, we seem no longer to have any patience for such a teacher, do we? 
academic scholarship and professional opinion militate against it. So let me be clear, I don't share this derision towards such fine teachers as Mr. Keating. Such people are fine, gifted individuals. Very often, at their own peril it seems, this I think is because they wield great power in the classroom and not just the power of authority. Any asshole can do that. What they have is the power of truth. And yes, despite the naysayers, such men and women make lasting positive differences in the lives of their students. But also, perhaps for many of you listening, such a teacher kind of intimidates you. Especially if Keating is held up as the model teacher for you to embody in your classroom, eh? What if you're not a performer? What if you're not somebody who naturally likes to take center stage? What if you're not so inclined to be provocative? What if you're an introverted person? What if you're a man or a woman of few words? Or who doesn't have such a mastery of the great texts? Or feel these sorts of powerful rumblings and eruptions of spirit that animate Keating? Are you going to suck? Is this what teaching is all about? Maria Montessori would say no. Emphatically, no. Good teachers, in her view, aren't mainly like Mr. Keating. That is, there aren't these comets blasting through the sky, brilliant heavenly lights that sputter out and die, sacrificing longevity for maximum grandeur. They're not like walking, talking Jimi Hendrix guitar solos. These, te- these best teachers are, in her view, hardly even there. They hold back. They withdraw. Not being the center of attention at all, their students become the center. Not being seen themselves so much as being able to see others and to truly see them, this is the key to the finest teaching, in her view. Now, Keating was a very very fine seer of his students' souls, I think. But maybe he doesn't fit the bill as regards holding back reservedly and not taking center stage. So, Maria Montessori came to take charge at her first children's house in the dirt and pain and suffering of early 20th century Rome with all this floating around in her mind and in her heart. She came to her work in this little school, having first laid a foundation within herself, having already practiced in her spirit this keenness for loving observation, for holding back, not seeking to manipulate, to master, to control, or to fix children, but to understand them through unobtrusive discovery. And so, on this feast day, Montessori experienced an epiphanic, miraculous event. One that you or I might, with some cultivation, also also likely experience in our own way. Namely, she came to be able to see in each child something of the divine base of things. The mysterious goodness, the grace that pervades all human beings and all of nature. It's funny how, as teachers, we often suppose that what we're doing in schools is learning them that our kids real good, filling them up with knowledge and skills and attitudes, already ourselves knowing what is most pertinent in the process of getting educated. But here in this slum, among these little children between two and a half and six years of age, Maria came to learn the deepest lesson of her life, deeper than anything she learned during any of her degrees, and to gain the deepest of insights into reality. How? Simply through actually, genuinely, really seeing the kids in front of her. Such a simple yet difficult thing. She writes succinctly about her epiphanic moment as follows. One day, as I looked upon these children with great respect and affection... 
I placed my hand upon my heart and asked, Who are you? Were these, perhaps, the little children whom Christ had embraced, and of whom he had said, Whoever receives this little child for my sake receives me. And again, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter into it. Unquote. With deep sincerity, as she shares her own powerful classroom experience with her readers, Maria has drawn our attention to one of the central difficulties of teaching and parenting, namely, our failure genuinely to see the children with whom we interact, and in failing to see them, also failing to help them grow and develop. Maria writes, quote, A child is like a foundling in the world. He is exposed to harm, he must struggle for his psychic development, and may fail in the contest. Adults do not help since they do not even know the forces at play. Much less are they aware of the miracle that is taking place, the creation of a psychic life from what is apparently nothing. Unquote. Adults, um, says Montessori, are prone to making what she calls unconscious errors in relation to children. Not because they're self-consumed, unloving, or egotistic, but rather because they're egocentric. That is, we only seem to be able to see things from our own point of view as adults. We fail to try to see things from the child's perspective, and we judge everything on our own terms and by our own estimation of value. However, the things that we think are most important, things like money, success, efficiency, competitive strength, these things aren't of the essence to kids. As long as we only look for our kids to excel at the things that they need to be good at when they're all grown up, we never see them as kids. We just see what we want them to be, not what they are. Montessori writes, There is in the soul of a child an impenetrable secret that is gradually revealed as it develops. This secret that is revealed, or rather this is the secret that is revealed in the epiphanic moment to an adult who has learned to cultivate the proper sort of observational spirit. And what is this spirit? It's the one that remains alive to the mystery and the miracle that lies hidden at the core of each child's being. Writing about our manner of interacting with infants, Maria observes, Our attitude towards the newborn child should not be one of compassion, but rather of reverence before the mystery of creation, that a spiritual being has been confined within limits perceptible to me. Now, I know what some of you are thinking here. Man, how am I, as a teacher, going to see my kids in my class like that, every single day. How am I going to stay alive or awake to that sort of insight? I can't even seem to see my own kids, my own flesh and blood that way most of the time. Honestly, I'm not even sure I know what the hell Maria's talking about when she tells uh, us to find reverence in the mystery and the miracle that is a child existence. Lots of times all I hear is the whining and all I see is the need to establish order to make some headway with the curriculum objectives and they get through the day without any major incidents and huge headaches. Well, if you were thinking such thoughts just now, believe me, I've had those thoughts as well. And such thoughts are not bad, ladies and gentlemen. If you have them, that doesn't make you a bad teacher. You're human. And you're, um, you know, you're held to account in the system to all these things you're worried about. And yes, you're right. Nowhere in the list of outcomes or teacher expectations do we find Maria's impassioned reminder for us to recognize the miracle that is each and every day. Our days as teachers are so organized institutionally, I'd say, to militate against such an awareness. 
That's why Maria Montessori says that having teachers who are convinced of the need for such seeing isn't enough. You also need to have a school and administrators that are on board and supportive towards teachers who would wish to teach in this fashion. And if you yourself are maybe feeling a bit uncertain as to what Maria is talking about in this kind of seeing or observing she's advocating, if you're a parent, think back to when your son or your daughter was first born and what you saw at that very first instance. Here I'm reminded of that Bruce Springsteen song, Living Proof, which I'll quote for you as follows here. On a summer night in a dusky room come a little piece of the Lord's undying light crawling, ah, crying like he swallowed the fiery moon. In his mother's arms it was all the beauty I could take, like the missing words to some prayer that I could never make. In a world so hard and dirty, so fouled and confused, searching for a little bit of God's mercy I found living proof. Hmm. You can listen to it. Bruce does a far better job of it than I did just now. Ugh. Anyway, whether or not you're a religious person, I think that as a parent you can really identify with Springsteen's poetry here that recounts the birth of his child and the experience he has of the wonder of life and moreover the leap in his heart that enables him to say yes and to affirm the world and existence as beautiful and good, even when perhaps just moments before uh, the world's horrors and its suffering and all our cares and troubles make it seem a hopelessly unlovable and callous and screwed up and unjust place. Montessori notes similar things about children, about how out of exhaustion, familiarity, and carelessness, we're likely, as parents, to not see our children. And how much of our time with them, we piss away. Simple examples from her fine book, The Secret of Childhood, will suffice to make the point. Such as when she gently reminds us not to be angered when our little ones um, get up so early on the weekend, say after a week of sweat and toil and mayhem. <laughs> Rather, treat such early morning awakenings as gifts of insight, innocently granted you by your children, who come to you as if to say, quote, Learn to live holily. It's already light. It's morning. Unquote. And not being angered, hear them say, such as, I did not wish to wake you from your sleep. I only wanted to rouse your spirit. Unquote. In this way, Montessori reminds us how there's a kind of loving seeing that is needed in the lives of adults that is certainly hard to come by in daily life, but that we can find most easily if only we're more attentive to seeing the children in our lives. And she writes, Yes, the love of a child is of utmost importance. Fathers and mothers fall asleep over everything and need a new being to rouse them and to reanimate them with a fresh and living energy that they no longer possess. Rise to another life. Learn to live better. Unquote. In her view, we owe what is best in ourselves to children. Without children to assist them, Montessori contends, men would degenerate. If an adult does not strive to renew himself, a hard crust begins to form around his heart, which will eventually make him insensible. Unquote. Who among those listening right now has not felt that hard crust around themselves? Do you want to get rid of that? Well, here's your chance as parents, and here's your chance also, most especially as teachers, says Montessori. For when you truly learn to see, or to observe unobtrusively, when you learn to leave your own ego behind, and attend to the spirit of another, watching and contemplating, 
contemplating it in order to understand its nature, in this fashion you come to see the very divine ground of things. In Montessori's own words, quote, Christ appears to men also under the guise of a child. And fools, it was Christ who came to waken us and teach us to love, but we thought it was only a childish whim and thus lost our hearts. Unquote. Both Montessori and Springsteen, it seems to me, um, awaken, or rather hearken us, to take notice of just how much truly seeing our children can transform us. How the life of parenting is a great gift to us if only we're careful to notice it. And of course, how the seeing that is fundamental to the true teacher's life is deeply, deeply invigorating and rewarding for us when we commit ourselves to it and when we're resilient in our daily practices. Indeed, from her own religious perspective, Maria Montessori sees in the child not only the salvation of all mankind, but also the very creation of the universe, ex nihilo, from nothing, being worked out miraculously before her very eyes. She writes, quote, One of the most profound mysteries of Christianity is the Incarnation, when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Something analogous to this mystery may be found in the birth of every child, when a spirit enclosed in flesh comes to live in the world. Unquote. As part of her own spiritual narrative, in other words, Maria Montessori was able to see, by means of loving her students, into the depths of being. Now, in Christian traditions, the word, as the word as Maria uses it, doesn't mean the Bible. Rather, it's a translation of the Greek term logos, which means a number of things, including word, speech, and reason. Christians also call Jesus, um, who they take to be the Son of God, or both God and man at the same time, or God incarnate, by the name of the Logos, which also means that, in a sense, for them, Jesus has always been around, since it was him uh, as the divine word that brought the cosmos into being. Anyway, as part of the Judeo-Christian creation story, God is said to have spoken the cosmos into existence by saying simply, Be! <laughs> and so it was, and Whatever he commanded um, into existence was good by its participation in his goodness. So as part of this narrative, inasmuch as you're able to see the being of another human being, of the world, or of yourself, you're seeing the manner of its participation in the divine. See? Moreover, you're seeing its reason, or logos, for existence. And because you're seeing what is the ground of its goodness, your own seeing is a kind of loving. Since what is good naturally inspire, inspires love within us, at least when we recognize it as such. And so all this is going on when you're truly seeing your students, suggests Maria Montessori. When we see like this, we see right into the very heart and mystery of things. What is mystery, anyway? How can I glimpse into the mysterious depths of things? How can I find that deep and underlying meaning to life? How can I see it in my daily work as a teacher? How can I avoid the deadening that so easily creeps into our work, becoming insensitive, or growing stale in my teaching life? For Montessori, all you need do is look to see the children before you. For in them, you may find all the mystery of the universe. Indeed, in her quote, or in her view, quote, the most urgent task facing educators is to come to know this unknown child and to free it from all entanglements, unquote. That is to say, 
when we cultivate this kind of seeing, it isn't good just for you and me as teachers. It's especially important for our students' welfare to be seen in this fashion as well. For by truly seeing them, we can avoid trampling upon their being, manipulating them, imposing our will upon them, making their voice our voice, molding them, shaping them, and forcing them to become the things that we expect them to be, that society expects them to be, that their parents expect them to be. Rather, if we take daily efforts to cultivate mindfulness uh, and in our observation and to remember our duty to withdraw and to hold back, we'll gradually find ourselves better able to fashion an environment in which their own nature, that is, the aspect of them that's called to be, might develop according to its own propensities and in its own due course. This element of passivity and reserve in teaching is especially key to understanding Montessori's views on child development, particularly between the ages of two and a half and six in our own school system. The first thing to be done, Maria writes, is to discover the true nature of a child and then assist him in his normal development. And here's the funny thing about that, ladies and gentlemen. You always hear about this or that method of teaching. Ten steps to success. The perfect method for children of this or that persuasion. Buy my book. Pay tuition to my school where we have the method that will bring about your child's success. Hell, there's even a thing called the Montessori method. And yet, listen to Maria and take her seriously when she writes in her book The Secret of Childhood, quote, There was no method to be seen, and was what was seen was a child, a child's soul freed from impediments was seen acting according to its own nature. They are not at all the product of an educational method. Unquote. <laughs> Here are the three essential components of Maria Montessori's writings concerning what she considers to be most needful in education. First, a humble teacher is required. Second, a suitable environment for learning. And third, the material objects that are suited to the particular needs of the children who, by working with them, are to be educated. In the remainder of this part of this lecture, let's discuss each of these three items in turn. First, to the so-called humble teacher. What does Maria Montessori mean by this? Well, in her view, to be a true teacher requires intellectual calm. By intellectual calm, she means a deeper calm, an empty or better unencumbered state that is the source of inner clarity. This calm consists in a spiritual humility and intellectual purity necessary for the understanding of a child. Unquote. Naturally enough, you can't learn that sort of thing from a teacher manual, from listening to a lecture or from passing your courses in a B.Ed. program, eh? Indeed, it's pretty silly to think that you can teach someone to teach at all, especially when you consider how Montessori suggests in all her written work that you can't even really teach a student to learn, eh? How teaching is more passive than active? And yet, there are such things as Montessori training centers, and we do require folks to get a B.Ed. in order to become teachers. But I digress here, and I don't want to argue myself out of a job, after all. In order to make sense of the confusion we've entered into here, let's turn, instead, to Montessori herself, in order to understand what she means about how we must live if we're to be good teachers. 
She writes, quote, A teacher who would think that he could prepare himself for his mission through study alone would be mistaken. The first thing required of a teacher is that he be rightly disposed for his task. The way in which we observe a child is extremely important. It's not sufficient to have merely theoretical knowledge of education. Unquote. Teaching, like learning, is about the cultivation of dispositions, of what folks used to call character, or long ago used to refer to as virtue. John Dewey affirmed that education was all about dispositions. Plato says that when he tells us that learning is a matter of eros, or love. In fact, pretty much all the great theorists say such things. Now, one of the dispositions needed to become a good teacher is a willingness to be reflective, especially because it speaks to our propensity towards self-examination and our penchant for self-knowledge. As Maria puts it, quote, A teacher must systematically study himself so that he can tear out his most deeply rooted defects. Now, I'm a bit leery of this tearing out business that Montessori speaks of here. <clears throat> I'm certainly no expert in such things, but in my limited experience with that approach to dealing with one's own personal deficiencies, attempting to tear things out from within oneself only makes them worse. It's like kicking a hornet's nest, and I'm going to go out on a limb stating my opinion that it's doomed to failure in the end. Of course, I can't speak for any of you, nor can I speak for Montessori here, but speaking for myself, I'd say the better approach is the one that Montessori would have, uh, would have us take towards the children, whom we seek to know via the loving gaze. That is, just as we do for our students, let's also become passive in our approach towards ourselves, eh? Let's not attack the ugliness we aspire within ourselves. Let's not seek to master it by the effort of our own will, according to some standard of goodness we seek to impose upon the aspect of ourselves that we've singled out and condemned to destruction. Those elements of ourselves that, in dealing with them, in this accusatory fashion, we only manage to make seem bigger and more real and more ominous. Those elements, when so attacked, cannot but arouse in us feelings of their undeniable reality, when in fact, they're merely egoic illusions that inflame our anger, our disappointment, and shame within ourselves. Rather, like good Montessorians, why don't we deal with ourselves as we might little children in a Casa dei Bambini? That is, let's try to remember to withhold our severity in our judging adult mind, to withdraw our hand and our will, which would assert itself as master. Let us instead stand back and observe these ego formations. Let them be. Let us endeavor to watch such things rise and fall within us, not acting upon our whims, not being swept up by the intensity or the urgency of our thoughts feelings, or sensations. Rather, as mindful observers of them, let us learn to gently cultivate release from all these things through basic daily practices of seeing. And honestly, I'm, I'm not even sure if Montessori really meant it just now when she told us to tear out evils from within ourselves. I'm a bit hesitant to believe that she actually meant to advocate such violence against herself as teachers. After all, at other places, she writes, quote, We have need of a special kind of instruction. We must see ourselves as another sees us. Unquote. But seeing from a distance does not equal doing violence against oneself, does it? And not just objective seeing from a distance, but also genuine study or studium, wherein the distance between knower 
and what is known disappears in a loving union. There's no violence or destruction implied here either, folks. Rather, if there is a metaphoric destruction of the self advocated by Montessori, it's only that, in genuine study, when knower and known are united as one, so too uh, do the lover, say the student, and what is loved, say the subject matter, cease to be disparate entities. Each becomes conjoined with the other, and delightfully so, too. For as we've already discussed this experience, one can certainly lose oneself in a good book, in a fine game, or in a wonderful loving gaze with one's beloved. That alienated self-concern that dogs us so readily, that pulls us out of the moment, and that serves us or serves to maintain the illusion of the ego miraculously and effortlessly dissipates and disappears whenever there's true contemplative seeing. This, it seems to me, is the most generous and proper way of interpreting Maria's rather provocative, if not alarming, advice to would-be teachers when she writes that, in relation to children, each adult should, quote, like other living creatures, give up his way, his own way of acting, and make a holocaust of himself, so that life may be carried forward towards eternity. Unquote. Yep, she used the word holocaust there, folks. That sounds like fun, eh? But again, let's try to understand... She's not saying, like John Candy and Joe Flaherty of SCTV fame in their farm film report, that we all ought to blow up real good. No, here, here she's really talking about how when we're teachers, we take up teaching as a way of life, and not just as a profession. We must be mindful observers of our own inner states, just as we must not be deceived into believing that these psychomental states are our own real identity, allowing these passing formations to blind us to our own inner logos, our own, or our own true being, so too must we not allow them to blind us to being able to see our students. Maria writes, quote, A teacher must be initiated. He must begin by studying his own defects, his own evil tendencies, rather than by being excessively preoccupied with a child's tendencies. First remove the beam from your own eye, and then you will clearly see how to remove the speck from the eye of the child. Unquote. Hmm. <laughs> Nor, in Montessori's view, is the interior preparation of the teacher the same as the sort of perfection sought by a religious adherent in his solitude. Good teachers don't have to be perfect human beings, ladies and gentlemen. Mind you, sometimes it feels like that when you're having a tough time. Sometimes people's expectations of you, as well as maybe your own expectations of yourself, are pretty unfair. But nobody's perfect. And in Montessori's words, quote, A good teacher doesn't have to be entirely free from faults and weaknesses. In fact, one who is constantly seeking to perfect his own interior life may not notice the various defects that prevent him from understanding a child. We must be willing to accept guidance if we wish to be effective teachers. Unquote. Generally, then, this Holocaust, of which Montessori speaks, is really her challenge to us to deal on a daily basis with the dangers of our anger and our pride. In her own words, one who would become a teacher, according to our system, must examine himself and forego tyranny, that is, imposing his will upon students, right? He must rid his heart of pride and anger. He must learn how to humble himself and be clothed with charity. Unquote. 
I hope you found in Maria Montessori's discussion of teacher training and teacher preparation something deeply valuable and insightful. Let it sit with you for a while. If you're not a religious person, try not to be turned off by her religious language. I'm certain she only uses it because she's trying to articulate deep things that have great meaning and import, and which, for better or worse, seem always to involve us in the use of one form of religious language or another. One could just as easily have spoken of such things using Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, or Jewish terminology. Likewise, the language of Greek philosophy as used by Plato or Aristotle might have been a possibility, except for the fact that Montessori's chosen to speak authentically about her deepest educational concerns using the language of her own upbringing and her own heritage. So as readers, we should try our best to listen to her words and to understand them, just like we would if we were listening to our own students talk about something of great importance to them, as you one day will have to do yourselves. And after all, when we listen to each other, and when we're careful observers, we're practicing the precise sorts of things that Maria Montessori would have us do as teachers in training. That being said, Maybe as you allow Montessori's words to sit with you for a bit, you'll come to appreciate her challenge to us as teachers to see our students and to see ourselves. Perhaps her educational ideas might serve as your own wake-up call to live better, more mindfully, more appreciatively, and consequently more happily. Able to find the gift in each day, and in every interaction with your students. A tall order indeed. Good luck.